OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Welcome everyone, special welcome to our panelists. We're so glad we could all join today. If you have a chance and haven't done so, please put your first name, last name, and agency name in the chat in case there's any questions that we could follow up with you afterwards. My name is Janice Farah, Program Specialist with CASAS, and I'd like to also introduce my uh, co-host today, Ms. Kay Hartley. Hi, I'm Kay Hartley, uh, also a, a Program Specialist with CASAS, and thank you all for taking time to attend this today. Our hope is that uh, the information shared by our panelists will be useful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me bring up my, uh, the slides that we were gonna share today. Uh, we would like to start off with a, uh, a peek at the agenda. What is high flex instruction? Just one slide on that. Introduce our panelists and they can talk a little bit about what is the area of focus in their agency as far as how they're approaching high flex and where their uh, attention is most directed. We'll have some questions prepared, but we've also got some time. This is a 90 minute session. So hopefully we can engage the audience a little bit and find out more about what your interests are and where you stand. There's also a poll that we've prepared. So um, Carla, I'm gonna just do the one quick review slide about what it means. And then are you almost ready to launch the poll for everyone? Yes, uh, give me the thumbs up and I'll launch the poll. So before we start the poll, because there's a lot of different definitions of what is high flex, we're going with the more traditional definition. Um, Brian Beatty, who is from uh, University, uh, excuse me, San Francisco State University, um, proposed an outline of what it is, which is when students are both in person and remote and the teacher is addressing them in those two, we say in the room and in the Zoom. We find that um, there might be reasons that it serves students well. And so from that framework, that's our next question, which is the poll. Go ahead, Carla, if you have a time, please. So the question is, is your agency currently offering high flex instruction? And if so, how many classes? And you can pick one reply, which is like one to five, six to 10, dozens, none, uh, but we are working on it, and none planned. So if you have a chance, could you go ahead and answer the poll? We've got 50% participation, 60, good. Thank you so much. I appreciate your feedback. Right now, we have a one more minute, maybe less than that. Okay, I think we're pretty much done. Um, Carla, would you like to share the results? It looks like it's a combination between one to five, um, none currently, but working on it. Okay, that's helpful for us. Great, thank you. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. And I'm just gonna go down through the list. Elisa Takeuchi from Garden Grove Adult Ed. Most of you in the audience probably have met her before, but Elisa, would you like to share a little bit about um, your attention to High Flex and what your focus is right now, please? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Um, so my name is Elisa Takeuchi. I am an ESL instructor for Garden Grove Adult Education. And it was very fortunate for us that our district opened up our schools um, quite early, uh, quite earlier than most districts. And so at the beginning, we were trying to figure out how we were gonna best serve our students um, going from all in class to all remote, then all of a sudden, you know, what do we do? And so we came up with the idea that we would go ahead and instruct students in class and online simultaneously on how they prefer to, to learn. Lisa, how many classes are you currently um teaching with the high flex model? All of them, all of our, all, all departments, all classes have uh, the high flex option, um, you know, whether or not the students have chosen to do in class or online is up to them. Excellent. We thank mm -hmm. you for your attendance and your participation today. Absolutely. Steve Hobbs from Merced, principal. Welcome, Steve. 
Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Hobbs. I'm the principal at Merced Adult School. Um, I'm excited to be doing High Flex. I didn't realize when we started this journey that this was actually the direction of adult ed, but I think when I was talking to Kay at one point, I said, this is more of a change in mindset um, to begin the process because I'm one that likes to have students on campus. I thrive when I'm talking to students and I was pushing for, I want our students on campus and the students were saying, we're not coming on campus. And uh, so yeah, I, had to change, <laughs> I had to change my mindset uh, a little bit. And luckily um, our high school district that I am a part of um, had gotten all the equipment for us and all, the, all of our high schools to start the process. So it's been good. Thank you. Laura Dutch. Hello, Laura. She's with Vallejo. Good morning. I actually like the fact that in the slides, HyFlex has that little line under it like it's misspelled because I think it's been a, a learning for all of us. I didn't know a year ago what HyFlex was. I didn't know two years ago what Zoom was, but here we are. Um, for us, we uh, five years ago when we did WASC, we put as one of the goals in our action plan that we wanted to increase student enrollment and persistence attendance. And then we were doing fine until COVID came along. And like everybody else, we had the challenges of going on to Zoom. So we came back in the fall. And at that point, we had to figure out what would work for our students. And like Steve's, we had students who wanted to be back in person, had been waiting for us to open up and be back in person. And then we had people who were saying, no way. So I had to look at the staffing I had. For ESL, I was able to keep people either in person or online with Zoom and students could choose. But when I looked at my high school equivalency, that's how I ended up with high set or high set. That's how I ended up with high flex because I had one teacher and I knew that the students were gonna be in that same category of wanting one or the other. So we bought some owl cameras and we started using high flex. And it's been a learning challenge. I actually talked with Elisa a few times about our hoot, we call him hoot, and but it's going well. And right now we're getting ready for WASC accreditation next spring. And all of our data meetings, we've had just a few so far, but with our staff has been focused on looking at the three different modalities, either in-person, Zoom, or high flex. And we're looking at enrollment, attendance, and outcomes. And outcomes being CASAS data uh, gains, looking at how many people have gotten their citizenship, how many people have finished high school diploma or high set, and just trying to figure out where we go from here, because I think it's great to introduce these, but I think the data piece of it is really important. So we know going forward how to, how to proceed. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. And we do have a couple slides at the very end about a new field we've added to TOPS Pro Enterprise for keeping track of high flex uh, class instances, and I can share that with you. Thank you, Carla. She uploaded a copy of the PowerPoint for today. Now, Laura does have to um, kind of leave in the middle of the presentation a little bit. She has a conflict in her schedule, but we appreciate you coming today, Laura. Thank you so much. Stephen France, Director at Aquilinus Adult Ed. Hi, Stephen. Good morning. Hi, Janice. Hi, Kay. Welcome, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon to those of us uh, that are attending from the East Coast. Um, my name is Stephen France, Director of Akalani's Adult Education. For those that don't know where we're located, we are located about um, 30 minutes east, depending on traffic, of San Francisco. We're in the Walnut Creek, Lafayette, Arinda, Moraga area. Um, and we are a high school district and an adult ed district only. Um, since I've taken over as director of the adult ed program, I've always wanted to offer some form of online learning for our adult learners being that most of my experience has been working in the high school setting. Um, COVID kind of pushed us in that direction and forced us to do that. So like everyone, when we shut down in March of 2020, strictly online, and in August, we were committed as a school site to offer flexibility options, support our student learners. We call them guests, by the way, so I will be referring to them as guests. Uh, we've done a lot of evolution during this time period. And we also wanted to maintain that persistence of our uh, guests and their learning and abilities to, uh, to access the instruction. 
it was just kind of natural for us to do it, considering that our high schools were still um, in online format. And we weren't necessarily having the guests ready to come to our school site in person, as we do also have a very high risk population of guests in our adult program uh, that are unable to attend in person because of COVID and their health issues. So it was just a natural push. The staff just jumped in. We, um, and at some point we'll talk about it later, but we uh, equipped every single classroom on this school site to have every possible tool necessary for the staff so that they're able to provide the best instructional opportunities for our guests as possible. So uh, it was something I wanted seven years ago, COVID happened, and here we are now with it all. And we offer it for all of our courses. And it's up to each individual teacher with their comfort level in some of those programs. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we featured Aquinas Adult Education during the October 2021 uh, CASAS National Webinar. So if you want to get more information, uh, Steve produced a beautiful video about their program there. Um, also, he's got a presentation. I think uh, Eric, your technology person, is presenting today at TDLS at 2.45. Yes. So, yes. Rather than having this panel get into the nuts and bolts of Wi-Fi and plugs and things, um, we're going to defer to that session today, later this afternoon. All right. Next up, please welcome Jennifer Varnell and Diana Batista from Conejo Valley Adult Education. Welcome, ladies. You want to share a little bit about what your uh, vision for HyFlex at your school is? Sure, I'll go first. My name is Jennifer Varnell, and I'm a medical instructor at Canaille Valley Adult School. And I think I'm one of the few here who is doing um, the high flex way of education. So um, for us, we were all on campus before COVID. And then we had our learning curve was just like straight up and down when we went to Zoom and started Zooming that way. And for me, that was great um, because I was able to kind of see students at home and what their lifestyle is, dogs, cats, children, um, kids home from college, which I could relate to, you know. And so we were, we were all learning this together. So there was a lot of grace and mercy when mistakes were made or, you know, something didn't work out. And um, through technology, we actually learned together. So when we came back on campus, I really saw the challenges that my students, I teach um, a certified caregiving class. And so I saw many of my students with the challenge of how do I get, how do I get certified in this and still take care of my loved one at home? How, how can I swing that? And COVID actually was um, in a sense a mixed blessing for our particular group because we um, were able to educate and encourage and inspire um, the folks who want to and need to stay home with their, their adult mother, their adult father, or their spouse who may have underlying conditions that would be compromised if they had someone come into their little bubble and they had to leave home to attend class. So when I came back, I wanted to continue that because I knew there was a percentage of our population that really desired this education, but because of the challenges that um, because of their lifestyle and who they took care of would not allow them to attend regularly a two and a half hour class in the morning or the afternoon and the evening. And that's how we offer it. We offer a morning class, two mornings a week, an evening class that's identical to it. So if someone missed the morning class, they can come to the evening class. It offers them that flexibility. We also have a, a very um, accelerated course where people come four days a week. And that's really exciting because it keeps people on their toes and they like that. And so, uh, and I enjoy it too. It, it does though, there, when you talk about barriers, it wasn't just a transportation barrier. Here in California, where we teach, um, the price of gas is almost $5 a gallon. And we have international students. So we have people who are here from Bogota, Greece, and they're, they're here and they could certainly afford the price of gas, but then we have other um, international students who are here and they cannot afford that gas. So they, may they come once a week 
to practice the skills. And that's when we kind of have the party day where we, and I know we've got the lecture, we've got interaction through Zoom, but then everybody arrives and we take off practicing all the skills. It's very difficult to teach CPR, first aid, how to take care of someone who's in a wheelchair, a catheter, a hospital bed. You, you, it's difficult to do that remotely. So we have to move our um, AVER media camera around so that when we demonstrate our students in the classroom and our students on Zoom are looking at a particular um, skill. And so when they all meet together on Wednesday, it's like nurses see one, do one, teach one. So they saw it, now they have to do it. And now they have to turn around and teach someone else that skill. And that's where I think um, the, the for, for our particular institution, that really marries very well together. Um, Yes, child care enters into it, but it's also elder care. And so I've made that point. But it also um, encourages other students who feel like they were forced back to the campus too early. When they see how interactive our Zoomers are, they, they'll come up after class and say, look, my, my mother-in-law's coming to, to town, you know, and we haven't seen her in a month. Is there any way I can Zoom this class tomorrow night? And I say, absolutely, I've already sent out all the links, you know, you know, just enter in. The, the challenge for me, of course, is I have to be on top of my game with attendance wise. And those people, when they miss, a, they miss something or maybe I'm a little ahead by a few slides or back, they already have my PowerPoints, the workbook and the, the regular textbook. And they can go at any time onto the web page and see, where their particular class is supposed to be, what they're supposed to be reading, what they need to be prepared for. Um, the last thing is within our medical department, we have a very high level of cleanliness and, and, and um, things need to be sanitized before every class and after every class. So yes, that's a bit of a challenge for me, um, but I've, we teach the students how to sanitize their own area. So now they know before they clock out that they have to go through and sanitize all the areas and wipe down all the equipment that they used um, while they were here on campus. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm gonna cut you short because we probably have a couple of more questions to answer. So I just wanna add that in our ESL program, the students also have the flexibility of being either in a strictly on-campus class or strictly in Zoom class. So that's why we're kind of marrying the two together, either strictly Zoom and then also um, in person along with this option to be in person or in Zoom with Jennifer's class. Thank you. So Diana, how many classes total do you have at Conejo that are following a high flex instructional model? Well, the high flex model is only in our um, integrated English learner civics education program with Jennifer through the caregiver class. The other classes are either strictly Zoom or in person. But what I think we're doing is baby steps still with increasing access for the students to get back to class. Even now, we still have some students who um, have a lot of underlying reasons why they don't want to come back to class. But like Jennifer said, they know they're required to come for the first day of class and each Wednesday for skills. So this way it gives them the option. I'm sure that everyone else has that same experience. We have a number of students that are on campus, but we do have um, six classes that are strictly in Zoom, ESL classes only. Definitely the pandemic has taken its toll on any of the hands-on kind of laboratory, phlebotomy, whether it's plumbing, the CTE classes are the ones. And we, um, we just applaud you, Jennifer, for finding ways to integrate remote education into what appears to be a very, very hands-on subject matter. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any questions in the chat? I'm just gonna peek over there right now, see if there's anything we need to, to jump on. These are some of the discussion topics that we're gonna to offer to our panelists, kind of just going in order, looking at things like challenges and equipment and collaboration and record keeping. So unless there's any questions, let me just sort of dive into the, the first discussion topic. And we're asking what were some of the unique challenges and the ways that you addressed those in your agencies. And I'm going to kind of offer this out to the panelists if, if any of you have a really kind of a, a thought about that that you'd like to share with the group. Well, I would say for me, the, the challenges uh, 
Well, just that you have teachers at such different levels of, um, oh, technology skills. Um, and so, you know, trying to find the, it's hard to find a PD that fits everyone because some of them just need to know how they switch from their camera on their computer to the uh, camera that's, you know, in the classroom and down to, okay, we're going into breakout groups. How do I keep the people online involved in the discussion as well as keeping the people in class and discussion? So there were such just different levels of, of need for, for uh, PD that it's really a work in progress every day still. With CalPro, CASAS, CalPro, and OTAN as, a, as the three age, the, the three supporting groups to the California Department of Education, we've talked about what kind of PD could be created. And that is exactly, Steve, what you said. That's the challenge we've hit is that, you know, does it have to integrate with Canvas? Does it have to integrate with additional frameworks and the different levels of expertise of the, of the teachers? Good point. Steve, how did you how did you approach um, the staff development with your teachers? I mean, did you have special training? Did you work with them individually? How did you do it? Uh, so when um, the district ordered these type of uh, all the equipment and put them in all the classrooms, there was district wide training. Um, and at that time, we only had a few teachers use it because we had some classes that were just strictly Zoom. Um, but what's awesome is my 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 staff is very a very tight knit group, and they are always bouncing ideas off each other. So I've literally walked into a class one week, and the teacher is doing high flex, but they're using the camera on their computer, so they're teaching from behind the the computer screen. Um, and I call that teaching to the online students and not to the students in the room. And then the next week I've gone in there and that teacher was up and teaching to the students in the room using the, the, uh, the camera in the room. And um, yeah, it's, it's just been a, an awesome progression. And if I see someone who's really lacking or I see where there's, hey, if you tried this, you know, I'll give those suggestions. And I've got an IT person on on campus that has done some PD individually, he'll go into their classroom and find out what exactly they need and get them to the next step. So that's been very helpful. I would echo uh, from uh, my experience, what Steve had said is the, the PD aspect and the training of the teachers was paramount during this um, rollout. Uh, when we first did our shutdown, I would send well, initially started daily emails out to all the staff with links to different um, trainings that I found that were online. My sister is also a teacher, so I would steal from her district what they were using as well. Um, and whatever our district was offering our K-12 side of the house and whatever else I could find in addition to what the state and federal uh, um, agencies were offering. Uh, then when I met with our uh, tech department, who um, I hope you attend his at 245, because he's he's been pretty much the, uh, the foundation of rolling this out, uh, he and I would hold almost weekly drop-in sessions for all of our staff on all the tools that we had from, from Canvas to Zoom to uh, Doceri, which he will be talking about, I think, in that presentation as well all of the six plus different cameras and microphones that we used. And it was an opportunity for us not to necessarily tell them how to do things, but for them to ask us how to use what was in their classrooms once they were exposed to it. Um, what I've always, uh, through my short, long career, I don't know, 20 plus years in education, uh, what I always despised about PD was always being told what to do and how to do it versus being able to, as the teacher, when I, taught English, how do I use the instructional materials? Like I needed to ask those questions. So it was important for me to have that exposure and opportunity for our staff to be able to ask those questions. And then we uh, set up training sessions in our Canvas uh, teacher training course that we uploaded short five minute videos. Uh, because if you've used Canvas, their training videos are nice, but they're very long. 
um, and they're not step by step. So I would record it um, and I would do step by step of how to do it based on what the teachers at those drop ins would ask us for. And it, the key was it had to be short, had to be succinct, and had to be targeted towards that one topic so that they could click in and see what they want. We then created a wiki page also for them to access the training videos. And we did a separate one for our guests. We did a guest training from their side of how to access all the tools available to them. Because when they're at home, they can't just necessarily go and seek out the teacher and ask for the assistance. So it was important to have those two models for all of them. Um, and then it was important to have my office staff trained in all of these tools so that as the teachers or our guests would call our office and ask for assistance online, they were also well uh, versed in all of the uh, accessibility. The other challenge was online textbooks. So we did partner with uh, some textbook companies. We were able to go from the uh, you know actual paper copy of textbooks, which I always seven years ago wanted to go to online as well, but to go back to what Jennifer was saying about having to clean everything, we couldn't sit there and clean a textbook and wait 72 hours and then reissue it and tell them to drop it off and be in our spacesuit for them to come pick it up from us. So we work with textbook companies and what we learned through that challenge was that some of them for adult materials didn't realize that they needed to also have accessibility and keys to log into Canvas so that our guests could access it in Canvas. So it was kind of an aha moment for our textbook companies that we are so great with our K-12 side of the house, they forgot about the instructional materials that we're using from the adult ed side. So we got a lot of those materials also. Uh, and then one other challenge we discovered was purchasing some materials that are not in the United States. For example, Oxford Picture Dictionary. We got it, but because of the nuances of purchasing within our district and within the state, it's difficult to purchase items that are international. So we had to figure out a way and a process to go through to purchase these online materials so that we could then be able to uh, purchase those online uh, items. So there were a lot of challenges, but a devoted and dedicated staff were what we had and all of us have, I know throughout the country and the world, and uh, we couldn't do it without just you know one person doing it all. We, we were a, a village. That's the collaboration among teachers that makes such a difference. Elisa, you had a lot of teachers that had to be um, brought into the knowledge base of, of HyFlex. Any, anything you'd like to share with us about that? Oh, sure. I mean, I'm just piggybacking on what Steven Steven said. Um, you know, for us, it was a very slow roll um, with our teachers because we, you know, we also have the gamut of, you know, experienced tech teachers and then, you know, some who, who were thinking about retiring during the pandemic because they didn't know if they could handle the challenge <laughs> and, and they persevered and, and, you know, kudos to them. But now we're asking them to combine this in-class instruction with the Zoom instruction at the same time. And so, when we were able to order the owls, um, they also came in in a slow roll because we have a bunch of them sitting out in a cargo ship out on the shores of Long Beach, you know, waiting to come. And so the ones that we did have, we asked the teachers who would like to um, pilot this, you know, the owl and, and use it. And so, you know, of course, the more techie teachers were the ones that got them first. And then now as we're still waiting, they're coming in slowly. The other teachers who have kind of experienced what the first teachers were doing with it can kind of see the benefits of it and and that it's not so um, scary and challenging and so we have now taken upon ourselves the ones who are have been using the owls to train the other teachers um, you know in in a very self-paced manner you know they're just taking baby steps and so that they're able to incorporate this new technology and and really feel comfortable with it with themselves because you know like we learned in the pandemic you know we all became students very quickly on you know so many different tech resources that after a while the teachers were so burned out uh, it was just incredible because they're trying to teach the students while they're learning themselves and so to really acknowledge the fact that some of the teachers just weren't going to be ready to do it at the same time was fine for us Lisa, I think you and I talked a few days ago and you mentioned something about the ability for one teacher to observe a class. Um, were we talking about that? That, that, that it's helpful for a teacher. You know, you can, you can give them it verbally, you can give it to them in a video, but just being in the classroom, in a, is, am I on the right track with that one? 
Um, I did. I don't remember the conversation, but we, yeah, that we do do that. I mean, our, we have multiple opportunities all the time for teachers to come and and observe if they want to, or or participate, you know, with somebody else standing there, kind of a mentor mentee, you know, situation. So that again, they could be with somebody if something. It, it, the the biggest challenge for a lot of the teachers during this time was troubleshooting. Um, you know, it wasn't the fact that you know we have this technology and here's how to use it, but what happens when it goes wrong? You know, something doesn't work now they're panicking because they don't understand how to fix it. They don't know how to troubleshoot it very well. So if a teacher came into my classroom and wanted to practice using the, the OWL or doing simultaneous instruction, then if something did go wrong, then I could kind of help and step in and, and you know guide them into figuring out how to fix the problem. Um, especially with the Zoom students, because that was the biggest challenge during remote instruction was to troubleshoot the, for the students on 12 different devices. And so you know, it's just that's again that slow roll, just getting them to that comfort zone and that that feeling of that. Yeah, they can go ahead and help the students if need be, and help themselves if they need to. Jennifer's nodding. Did you have a thought on that, on that Diana? Yeah, I was uh, thinking of asking Jennifer to share. How do you address the learners in the room and the learner? What challenge that you had that you shared with me about learners in the room and learners online, and and how did you address that? One of the sure. questions coming up when we actually talk about students collaborating. Okay, um, I don't want to jump ahead. Thanks. Okay. Um, Shall I go thing. ahead? Um, what I do is I turn my camera, my my uh, camera around um, when the Zoom class, when our Zoom students. So I say hello to them, then I flip it around so they can say hello to all the students in the classroom and make kind of eye to eye contact. What's interesting for me is that we say in person learning but I don't really um, get to see people's faces unless they're on Zoom because of the mask mandate. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's hard to read people's facial expressions when they're behind their mask here in the classroom. But I typically turn it around. I've set my room up so that there's a, a more open spot in the classroom where both our Zoom students and our in-room students can talk to each other um, and see each other um, practice the skill which is really good. I also have um, times where I'll set up um, teams to do to practice verbally what's going on um, in the homework. And then I'll just walk through the class and I go just tap me if you don't understand how to say a word or you guys disagree about the, the answer to the medical question. And so that's how I've um, um, addressed those kind of challenges. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, one great note in, from Gould M, is that you, Peg? <laughs> Saying that they did a pilot trial program, a large number of refugees who attend via Zoom at the same, same time as the local ESL students who attend in person. Thank you for your comments on that. Okay. Our second question got into a little bit of the nuts and bolts of equipment and costs, and we've touched on OWL cameras and doseri. Anybody else have anything that you, you feel your agency uh, wants to share. I, I know we did, CASAS did a survey at, in December of several agencies doing high flex and we said, what's the cost per classroom? And we heard numbers from just a few hundred dollars up to several thousand dollars. Anybody want to talk about that just a little bit? We still have plenty of time. Steve. Our, our cost, uh, actually checked with fiscal before we got into this, was for everything which was the, oh, I want to say it's the Acer camera. Oh, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, it's not the owl, which I would like to have a discussion about the owls at some point. Um, but Is it with the media? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Um, and between the camera, the stand, um, the uh, microphones, um, everything was about fifteen hundred dollars per classroom. I just wanted to jump in. I'm sorry. I'm just going to jump no, in real quick. So um, myself and my director, Melissa Patterson, we are also going to be in that 245 session um, with Marjorie um, talking about equipment. So if anybody is really interested, you know, more, more so about um, the equi equipment from the teacher's perspective and then the equipment from an administrator's perspective about purchasing and costs and things like that, that will also be addressed um, later on today. 
Yeah, and I, I echo what Alyssa said as well. My tech guy will be in there and then I'll be joining to support him. Um, mm -hmm. But we did purchase a lot of materials uh, for the classrooms, but one that we discovered was, was most important was a microphone that we installed in the ceiling so that mm -hmm. the guests at home could hear very clearly what our, our guests in the classroom were saying um, and the teachers. So we had to kind of go through different iterations of microphones. Um, you know, we purchased a Logitech camera for all the classrooms and we used, we have two iPads for classrooms, a lot of stuff but we had to get that microphone that could capture the size of our classrooms. So that was an important investment and you could spend anywhere from, you know, a couple hundred dollars to something that may work to thousands of dollars, which was just out of our budget. Um, but again, I don't want to steal the thunder from the 245 presentation, but there's a lot of tools. And if anyone is on here, that's not an administrator um, and is interested, the key is working with your tech department and your site administrator to kind of go into the classroom and the administrator has to have an idea and your business office of what is needed to support our guests. Yeah, they look at it from the dollars and cents and how much it's costing, but we also have to look at the desired outcomes and supports for our guests in person. Um, and I love what Jennifer said, hidden behind a mask, so eyes and, and forehead, um, and then on online as well. Um, and it's all about that experience. So I'm all about the experience of that of our guests. And um, you can't assign a, a dollar value to that. Um, you can. It's a budget. My business office hates when I say that, but you do have to invest in order for it to be successful. Right, because it's all about student engagement. And if you don't have the students there to learn, then they're not going to be able to progress within your programs and stuff. I just want to address something that Marin put in the chat really quick. I have done multiple staff meetings using my laptop as well as the in-classroom desktop computer. And um, I did experience some of the problem that Stephen just talked about, where some of the teachers that were in um, Zoom couldn't necessarily hear what the other teachers in the room were saying. So I'm sure that would be the same case with the, the students. And um, it's sometimes a little you know, awkward between, because what I'm doing is presenting the presentation on the desktop computer so that the people in the room can see it, but I'm trying to use my laptop so that I'm interacting with everyone. And I also do what Jennifer does, where I turn the camera around and I project the people in the room, you know, um, in the Zoom room to the people that are in the classroom. So it's just, it's a matter of working through the, the, the bumps and different things. But if there's this equipment out there that makes it easier, then, you know, we should defer to the experts. So I'm going to have to jump off in just a minute, but I'm really enjoying the presentation. Please evaluate it so it gets recorded and shared. Sorry, Jennifer, you wanted to jump in? I did. Um, I don't want to. Um, one of the other ways, and I mentioned it to, uh, to all of you, was that um, for our students, a lot of our, our students are very tech savvy. And so I've also asked them if you've got a particular angle on the skill um, and one of your student, one of your Zoom fellow students um, is having a challenge seeing it right now, you know, do them a favor, just like you would in the classroom if they need a highlighter or if they need something, turn your FaceTime phone on, Tim, turn FaceTime on your phone and use your phone to help that student see what's going on. And um, they actually love that because it's all of a sudden like, oh yeah, I can help, I can help. And it's just like when I tell them, just like in nurses, you see one, you do one, you teach one. So you're allowing your fellow student to see it better. So when they're here on, on campus on Wednesday, they can do it. Excellent. That's the collaboration that, that makes it a difference. And collaboration, I believe, leads to persistence. It makes the students feel like a cohort and it helps them stay together as they go through the program. And if I may interject one more thing I forgot about is the Wi-Fi arrays. We discovered that we were implementing so much technology and that our guests were bringing technology in the classroom. Our teachers had it. We're all accessing it. We had to invest in making sure that we had the most robust Wi-Fi. So we installed a Wi-Fi array in every single classroom so that we weren't draining it too much and causing interference um, of the other classroom that may be, uh, you know, right next door to them. So, 
throw out one extra uh, question about costs. Sometimes uh, with since the pandemic, it's been more difficult for agencies to have a certain number of students in a room. So my question to any of you is, um, is there a cost savings at all with HyFlex in terms of facility costs or addressing the cost of um, hunting for an instructor if it's if it's possible that an instructor could be able to address like um, I, I enjoyed the presentation yesterday from Roz Tolliver, and she mentioned how she is remote most of the time and that how she's able to engage with her students. Any any comments on those types of uh, facility pressure or uh, teacher shortages that this possibly has an impact on HyFlex? Any thoughts on that? I, I haven't had any issues. Um, there hasn't been really a, a savings. Um, it has made some of our classes bigger, um, but not to where it's unmanageable. Um, I know Kay and I have our monthly network meetings here in Northern California, and we had agencies talking about waiting lists of students and being able to include more students because of the, the different models of instruction when they bring in uh, the options of high class. Okay, anybody else? We were talking about collaboration. We didn't get to go around the room, Steve or Steven. Um, I know Jennifer shared a little bit about collaborating with the students. Do you have any any thoughts or comments, Elisa, on that? With uh, just in my in my uh, walkthroughs and, and observations. Um, so you know, we have our all of our computers are set up to smart boards, which are now really old technology, but um not only can the the online learners through the camera see the, the students in class um because the smart board is acting as like another computer screen uh the in-class students can see the students on zoom and so i did go into an esl room uh the other day and i thought it was really cool so there was a, a partner reading so they were learning conversation and so one partner was reading reader one and the air partner was reading reader two. And the teacher was doing a great job of, okay, for reader two, I need somebody who's in person. For reader one, I need somebody that's online. So they were actually going through the conversation with each other. One was at in class and one was at home. And I thought, wow, that's really powerful. Um, then if we do things like breakout groups or okay, partner up, she either has the students online go into breakout rooms or if it's a smaller group online she'll just have them interact or she'll put them all in one breakout group so they can interact um but that again that goes back to training and and you know who feels comfortable doing what knows the process and but we're slowly getting there but it's it's once it's when you see it in working it it's it's awesome and we're Lisa, still are you doing that sort of thing with your can you tell how you do that with your students oh why don't we have steven um finish his thoughts and then oh, i'm sorry no no that's fine <laughs> i was just going to jump in and say we're we're kind of right there with steve we're kind of getting over these speed bumps of training and uh getting our teachers comfortable with um collaboration between our online and our in-person guests um but Instead of investing in whiteboards, we purchased this site license for each classroom called Doceri. So each classroom has two iPads. One iPad is for the teacher to use to see the guests online and the backward facing um, camera is, is pointed towards the classroom so that they can see it. And the other iPad, it becomes a mobile whiteboard for the students using the Doceri app. So whatever is on the whiteboard in the classroom, if the teacher, um, traditionally would write on that they couldn't see it from the camera that we had we have uh, I think three different cameras in the classroom but it wasn't able to be seen unless you used a blue or black marker so with doseri what we did is it becomes a live actual uh, interactive whiteboard for the for the teachers so they can walk around the classroom whatever they're mm -hmm. writing on that uh, iPad of that slide is what the guests at home and in person can see. We have teachers experimenting with it. And what's great is you can then PDF that slide and attach it to your Canvas page or whatever you use. And so that that becomes the note taking piece for, the, uh, for that particular class. And it can be individualized for each classroom. Um, 
but we also have enough iPads that we purchased throughout the years um, that we're having some teachers explore and experiment with giving an iPad per in-person group and then assigning, quote, a breakout group to that in-person group so that there's guests at home and guests in person that can interact with each other. And so they kind of compare that way. So it's kind of, you know, having, a, you know, three, three, three of our guests on an iPad with three in person and interacting and working together. And then we, you know, what I'm working with the teacher right now is that you assign the breakout room per table group. So table one is breakout group one, and then they work together. So it's kind of a, a a training that we're still working on. Uh, so if anyone has great ideas, I'd love to hear it. I'm so glad I, went, I'm, I let you go first, Stephen, because um, <laughs> just hearing about, because for, for three months from um, March of, well, it's April of 2021, April, May, and June, um, we were, we opened up our school for the first time after pandemic and we, you know, uh, opened our doors for the students and I was kind of going blind. I really just kind of envisioned in my head how I wanted my classroom to work and how I was going to keep this community with my online students and my in-class students. And as I was doing presentations along the way, more toward the fall, um, I got a lot of good ideas in hindsight, I wish I would have used. And one of them was the external camera that I would have you know, mounted on my laptop or a monitor and faced toward the students. Um, I didn't do that. And so I physically yeah. took my laptop and would flip it around to show the in-class students, my Zoom students. And I, you know, I didn't do it very often. And so, you know, sometimes that connection was lost. Um, I could project my Zoom students onto my big projector so my in-class students could see the Zooms, but not vice versa. My other thing, so just learning from my experiences, um, you should, <laughs> I, um, I was using a headset because I was so used to being remote for that whole year. I was still using a headset with a microphone in my classroom because I didn't know how else to hear both the, my Zoom students. And it didn't dawn on me, which was, I, I, in hindsight, I'm kind of laughing at it now, is that I really should have just plugged in some external speakers and um, used my computer microphone. And I'll, even though it would have been a little bit more difficult for my students in class to hear the Zoom, um, I wouldn't have had, I was just relaying information all the time. Oh, Hun, you know, who was online, Hun said da, 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 da. And then, oh, in my class, so-and-so said da, da, da. And I was going back and forth and relaying this information. And, and I, didn't, I didn't see it later on until after somebody suggested to me about these other suggestions, like, oh, okay, that would have been much easier for me. Now, you know, so for three months, I made it work, but it wasn't ideal. And, and you know, again, it's, it's because of time and experience. And then other, other teachers are hearing about my experience. They're like su making suggestions. And I was like, you should have told me this three months ago. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, you know, so it was a learning curve. Um, I don't regret anything, you know, uh, you know, there were some things I definitely would have changed, but as far as collaborative, so now, because I have the, the, I'm so fortunate to have an owl, it's so easy. I mean, it's seamless to have my Zoom students and my, um, in-class students collaborate with each other. And so every morning I put the Zoom up on my projector still, but you know, my every morning my in-class students come in and we say good morning to the Zoom students. The Zoom students say good morning to, to the in you know the in-class students. And then we do our conversations and we ask questions with each other, just like uh, Steve and Stephen was talking about, um, just having that because it's the Zoom students that for right for me right now, I have far fewer Zoom students than in class. And so they're the ones who are kind of missing out on that in class, you know, like that classroom experience, that socialization. And so I, I think it's really important. So I keep the Zoom students on my big whiteboard all the time so that if I ask them questions or if they're answering a question or practicing pronunciation, they're right there with my in class students. And so that's been really, really helpful. Um, the other panelists, do you find that same ratio of students in the room versus students in the Zoom that the, the number of Zoom students is usually fewer than those in class or not always? Yeah, that's my experience. I usually just have two or three um, on Zoom compared to the rest of the class. And the way that I, I mean, I, we don't have the funds right now. We, we, we base our budget on what we got in 2020, which is not enough to buy the technology that we need, we need right now to really move forward with this. And I, I think that's probably why I'm the only one doing it. <laughs> but 
but um, the way uh, the way our workaround is FaceTiming. So at the very beginning, I I asked permission in writing, would you be willing to FaceTime um, a fellow student um, to work on pronunciation, communication, go over homework, collaboration, so that they can feel more part of the classroom, and it it would help you to increase your knowledge with what it's like to Zoom in case next semester you wanna Zoom a class because of transportation issues or what have you. And that's we that's how we do it. And we have the bandwidth here with um, our Wi-Fi. We have both teacher Wi-Fi and guest Wi-Fi. And then we also have a full-time IT guy who's just, I mean, he'll pop in and say, I got your email, how can I help you make it happen? And um, uh, he's, he, Jim's really great about that. I would just say in terms of, of numbers, for us, it's been right along with the pandemic. So when we started to come out of the original pandemic, you would start to see four, five, six, seven, eight students in class and everybody else online. And then I remember walking into an ESL class who, when this full st uh, first started, ESL students were like, nope, I'm not coming to class. Do not bring anything from school to my house. I don't want to touch anything you bring. No, stay away. I'll come back when we're ready. <sighs> then they started to come back on Zoom and we checked out every Chromebook that we could find. Um, and then again, as, a, as the pandemic started to, to, to slow, we got getting more and more in class. And I walk into an ESL class one day and it was full. And I looked at the teacher and I went, wow, this is awesome. And she goes, and I have 15 more online. And I was like, holy smokes, which is the biggest classes. I've been here, this is my sixth year. That's by far the biggest class we've ever had. So I walk next door, the other ESL class. Oh, she probably had 18, 19 in class and like another 10 or 12 online. And I'm going, wow, this is awesome. But then as the new variant, you know, came into play um, it, again, then it went the other, the other direction again. Now I've got one class that's just online. Nobody will come to class and the other one's about half and half. But um, I'm hoping at some point we get to those numbers where I'm going, you know, my mind's blown because all the students we have, but um, I'm hoping that's coming soon. Anyone else want to share on that? The other question in the back of my mind is, what's your typical class size in high flex? Uh, the Steve, the number you just threw out was like, I think I heard 12 and 18. So that's 30, so, you know, simultaneous instruction to 30 students. Is that, you know, 25, 20, 30? Um, in the back... Before the pandemic, we probably had anywhere from, oh, 20 to 30, 32, maybe. But for a, a teacher to do high flex with 20 or 30 is still, you know, doable and comfortable. I'm looking for some nods. For yeah, they, they actually seem to enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, I don't know. My joy is going into an ESL class and watching them giggle and laugh because they're, mispronouncing things and you know they're having a good time the teacher is giggling and laughing and um yeah it doesn't seem to be an issue in terms of numbers at least i've never had a complaint or told them that we're, we're, i'm stretching them so um i would address it if, if we were yeah we were capping ours at um a total of 30 pretty much 15 in person and 15 online and the 15 in person because of the social dis social distancing and everyone facing in the same direction. Right. Um, and then online, we wanted to cap it no more than 15 so that our teachers didn't have more than a 30 caseload per class. And that was intentional from the administration level, yeah. setting it up that way. And I, you know, I have monthly uh, ELL department meetings and we kind of discussed it of what would be doable. Uh, for them and they're you know they're accustomed to having you know 40 packed into a classroom whether all 40 show up is another story but um, but 30 seemed to be that magic number that we could um, that our teachers could agree to um, to teach in this high flex model let me kind of put the question out to our audience um, if you want to type in the chat any any notes you have about those classes that you do currently have at your agencies that you're offering in a high flex model? What's your what's your ratio of 
you know, number per Zoom versus number in the room, number face-to-face -face versus remote. If you have a chance to put that in the chat, that would be interesting information to share with our panelists. Thank you. Yes, can I um, just quickly sure. just mention something? So just in the last probably month or so, um, well, okay, so since we opened up from this school year, um, our in-class uh, population is far exceeding our online, you know, our online presence. And so I was thinking about this pretty heavily in that um, I think for my in-class students, because a lot of them are the new, my, my, the Zoom students that we had are mostly the continuing students from remote. A lot of them did not come back to school. They were very comfortable being online and they wanted to stay there. And then with the new students, uh, dominantly they wanted in-class versus online. So we have very few new online students. But, and so again, my in-class students are all new students as well. And I was thinking about this about a month ago in that, I have Chromebooks in my classroom now, and I'm going to start teaching my students how to Zoom, my in-class students how to Zoom, because I didn't want to be caught blindsided like I was back in March of 2020, where all my in-class students, we had no idea what Zoom was, right, or, you know, virtual meetings, maybe some of them used FaceTime, but that was about it, but I, I really thought to myself, I'm going to start utilizing how to do Zoom. So in case something happens in the future, we have another outbreak or something happens and we close our schools again, at least my in-class students will have an opportunity or a chance to, to join me on Zoom. Because right now, I, I don't, I had this talk with, with um, Patricia, who's, who's in the room too, uh, in regards to um, the teachers now have the option to let their students flip back and forth, and I don't because uh, for me, if if my students who are in my class primarily decide to join Zoom just for a day for whatever reason, I'm going to take more time out of the class trying to troubleshoot with them how to do the Zoom because they didn't go through orientation, they didn't go through any kind of um, pre-training. And so to me, it seemed very distracting. Um, other teachers may, you know, for especially higher level English classes, they may have a different perspective on that because it might be easier for them to talk them through certain, you know, areas. But for my beginning literacy class, um, I'm thinking I need to teach them how to do Zoom because it's going to be useful for them anyways. If they get a job and they have a Zoom meeting or, you know, a Zoom interview or things, this, these can only help them. But I didn't, again, want to be blindsided like I was two years ago um, with all, you know, half my class just disappearing because they didn't know how to get online and, and go to school. So that was just my take. <laughs> and to piggyback what Elisa saying is we are now um, putting that into our orientation. And I can't remember if it was Kay, Janice or Barbara. We had uh, one of our, our area meetings, we had somebody who is addressing the um, less than 12 hours of instruction students. And, yes. and we think a big part of that is because um, those that are like online or, uh, and are wanting to do online and they don't know how to either access their email, don't know how to access their Zoom, that's becoming a barrier. So uh, exactly what Elisa said is, is we're now going to make that part of our orientation and do that training for all students that you're talking about. And hopefully it'll help with that uh, number of less than 12 hours of instruction too. Clever, clever. I've heard about orientations that agencies are starting to build around the, um, I had, I think it was in one of the sessions yesterday, someone said, yeah, we have like a boot camp in the summer to get the students ready. Um, Alisa, my hat's off to you as an, you know, in your role as an ESL instructor that you also take on the role of being a technology guru on that with your students. And many, many teachers aren't in that role. And um, I know one of the agencies here in Sacramento was saying that they have, you know, different levels. They brought in students that spoke multiple languages and used them in a part-time kind of a, almost like an IELCE sort of a, um, learn as you go while you're also in learning how to be a technical support person and use their language skills to help very beginning uh, English language learners to understand how to do Zoom. And they were able to do that in their native language. Just uh, ideas out there, the way agencies are, are doing that. Um, yeah, any other questions? Let's see, um, Patrick's asking, hi everyone, actually like, one third to two thirds offline. Oh, this is going back to the question about um, online, the ratio between students that are offline versus students that are online. Oh, based on COVID uh, testing 
mandates from the campus. Interesting, great. Um, Carlos got a link for the feedback in the chat. I'm going back a little bit. I think David Rosen, you had a question um, that was kind of out to the to the panelists. Do any of the panelists have in-person synchronous or asynchronous where the student can choose the mode day to day? Um, Jennifer answered that in the chat. Anybody else want to take a stab at that question about the flexibility to the student about attendance model? I think they kind of addressed that as they were discussing the the um, setups and options. I know Steve Hobbs said that uh, students have the option of choosing which uh, they prefer to do. Um, on am I correct, Steve, on a daily basis? And Steve um, Prince our, said it was dependent on on their uh, classrooms uh, capacity. How many were able to be in class as opposed to how many could be online? Go ahead, that, Steve. I'm that sorry. Was Steve, that was Steve France that talked about right. the capacity. Yeah. Um, ours, they're either here or they're, I mean, they, that's not totally up to them. If they show up, great. If if they want to be online, they stay online. Yeah. And we stress with them, and especially in our orientation, that if they are going to be, say, selecting in person and then as they're enrollment option and then they need to for whatever reason whether they have COVID and need to quarantine or illness whatever this is allowed flexibility um, it's a great teaching tool for the students to use their communication skills and communicate with the teacher to let them know and the office know that they'll be switching to online for whatever day or days it's going to be uh, but we do ask them at an at orientation specifically in person or um, online so that we have those enrollment numbers and then do the flexibility from there. Steve, Marin is asking about your orientation process and you mentioned that you have an orientation video. Would you be willing to share that with people so they could see the types of things that you have done? Yes, I have, I, I will get it, I will find it. Thank I'll you. I'll send it to the two of you and then you guys can disperse Perfect. it out once I find it. it I, I have many files, so I had to find them. Perfect. And then uh, she also said, and I, this was in relationship to your comments about the importance of having your front office staff trained. Um, if there are any tips and tricks on how you do that so that they're able to uh, support learners when they call in and ask questions. Fortunately, and I know uh, Kay and Janice, you know Michelle, our registrar in our front office, um, she is very tech savvy. Um, and then our transition specialist that we have as part of our consortium that we've hired here for our program is also very tech savvy. Um, but what also helped with that is the, the devotion of 50% of um, our tech who is gonna be presenting later today, we pay 50% of his salary so that he works 50% of his time with adult ed only. And he, when we roll these things out, he walks us through and helps kind of guide us through it. Um, I love technology and can see how it helps. Um, and then my administrative assistant also. So the four of us in the office are always available to help. Um, and we didn't roll anything out without our trying it first. We kind of wanted to know what it was, what it looked like, and we're part of those um, drop-in training sessions that the uh, staff had availability to during the initial complete shutdown and lockdown. That was just kind of the expectation requirement. Thank you very much. I know, I mean, thinking back to my years in administration, um, I think sometimes it's not always thought by administrators to include their clerical staff in that type of staff development that makes it possible for them to do that. It's not always seen as their responsibility, but the, I think it's, it's really important that it be integral, that they be integral in the training process so that they know what is going on and some of it came level. from them specifically because they were you know they were getting the calls from our guests and our teachers like what is this and it's like oh yeah i've, I've got to remember to train you 
but also it helps that uh, my mom was a classified employee in a school. <laughs> and she always reminded me when I became an administrator, never forget the classified, which is why I'm very adamant. I don't call it faculty and staff. We are one staff because there is that delineation. So when we have a staff meeting, everybody is part of that. We are one team and we're not segregated by our titles and our credentials and services. I. I can do just, you know, my administrative assistant can do just as much as I can. It's just a difference in title and that doesn't matter. So, um, but it's important that they know that. So administrators on here, train your office staff because they're going to save you a lot of time and they're going to save your staff a lot of heartache. Um, and they're going to be uh, providing much better customer service uh, for your programs, which will increase your enrollment. And to pick his, I can't, I can't stress what he just said enough. If you can just teach your front office staff to teach students how to check their email and how to log on to Zoom, that took away 90 by 95% of our issues. I got, I fielded so many calls and inter, uh, um, emails from teachers that were spending so much time, class time, trying to get students logged on, trying to figure out how to get them on Zoom, why can't they find their emails, that it, oh my, they weren't teaching. And they were getting burned out and upset. And I finally just said, you teach, refer anybody with any issues at the front office. And my front office staff just ran with it. They got trained on what they needed to, but it just took away so many issues. That's great. That's great. I mean, that's, that is the way to do it. Thinking outside the box. And well, then the whole teach. agency becomes a learning environment. Yes. <laughs> it's not it's not a segregated job of just the teachers to teach. Right. Well, the one thing that we're devoting here in, in Aklani's Adult Ed that I've worked with our human resources department on, uh, I've hired a new ELL teacher who will be teaching our literacy course, but she's also coming to us having taught what I refer to as computer literacy. She has a big fancy title for it, but she's gonna be teaching the course for our ELL students, number one, but number two, um, as part of our onboard process next, starting in next fall, of all of our classified staff in the district, part of their requirement is gonna to be to take, and we haven't figured out what that perfect time is, but teaching them all the tools that we have in the district on how to access the technology so that all of our staff throughout the school district are trained because we, you know, we have classified staff who are enrolled in our ELL and the workplace courses that don't know how to even access their own district email. So uh, we're devoting a time as a district um, to do this training for all classified staff um, in addition to our ELL population in adult secondary eds. Super, Steve, and I, I think that's, it's going to be, they're going to see you as, as high value added for providing them with that. That's a great, great strategy. Others should try it. Our next slide, Janice, do we have, okay. Our next question. We're looking at um, questions about attendance and assessments that, are there any record keeping requirements that your agency feels need to be addressed? or different uh, options for tracking things. Anybody have any thoughts you wanna share about that? And I know Kay and I have peaked at data over the last few months within TOPS Pro Enterprise. And to us, it seems like it might be a little too soon to talk about outcomes for high flex versus non high flex classes. Any, anybody have any thoughts on that, on this from our panelists? I would say, yeah, it's probably a little too soon, um, but I just go to my data entry to make sure that all the right boxes are checked for um, in top so that our teachers can take, you know, accurate uh, attendance. But in terms of outcomes, yeah, I'm not there yet. Um, at Garden Grove, we have been really good. Our director was really good about from the get go, really establishing the numbers as far as in class students versus online students. And so we have a, a, a support clerk that will come and actually check, you know, in, in a because in our attendance and area we're just clicking whether they're here or not it's not segregating whether they're in class or online and so we have a clerk that will walk around and actually take count and she'll she'll ask us how many in-class students and how many online students there are but as far as that it stops 
So as far as like um, gains, EFL gains and things like that, it's, it, you know, we, it's too difficult for us to kind of now go back through the data and, and you know, then start separating it. So I'm pretty, I'm really, really excited actually about what Kay and Janice are going to talk about um, as far as um, Casas's solution to that in the future. So I, I think that because we started this data from the from the get go, we have an idea of how we would like to see different, you know, data points on. Do the on class, you know, online students um, are there, you know, are they are we meeting their needs and they're getting their EFL gains um, more so or less so than the in class students, you know, and what what is the difference uh, percentage wise. So and then pre and post tests too. do we have more you know success with our in class students versus our remote students and things like that so i'm, I'm pretty excited about what's to come from CASAS um, in regards to actually segregating these these data points for us so that we can see it very clearly. But let me just kind of step um, thank you for that introduction, Elisa and, and Steve, about checking the box. Let me share a couple of slides that are in the PowerPoint that, um, that Carla so kindly has uploaded to the chat. There's a new option when you define a class in Tops for Enterprise, the class instance. It's over here in the instructional setting, and it's a checkbox called HyFlex. And one way that we envision agencies being able to use it is, let's say I have a class and there's two different sessions happening. There's one that is, as you can see, distance learning only, and then there's one that's high flex. So if you track your attendance and your outcomes and things, you can run a report and in Tops Pro Enterprise, you go over onto that left column here where you select the report navigator and you can choose just that one class. So if I ran the NRS Persister report on this first class with the high flex check, and then on the second class, without that setting, you could get two different reports and compare. So if you're looking, um, the columns that come up in the persister is average attendance and percentage with an EFL gain. So I'm hoping that as we get closer into June, that these numbers will, will fill up a little bit for agencies and they can go ahead and um, pull more statistics out for what's going on uh, in their agencies. So let's. Um, Janice, is that available right now? Like, can yes. we do that today? And like, even though we're in the middle of a semester, I mean, will it, you know, you know, project backwards in, you know, and retro all the data from before too? Right. Um, like if you were to go into the class instances lister, you could say, which are the classes that I've identified as high flex? Mm -hmm. And then within Tops Pro Enterprise, depending on how you mentioned Aries doesn't segregate between distance versus face-to-face. -face. If you were doing that using a daily model, it could actually calculate the attendance hours very easily. But it will it can reach for the ones like the, ELL, the EFL gains, that it can do very simply between one class that's high flex and one class that's not. And that's in current build 25 of Tops Pro Enterprise. So what, what we're, uh, but I guess you, yes, I think Janice probably has something in here, but what we're project asking of these people, they've been very gracious in their uh, willingness to work with us on this. And between now and the end of this uh, school year in June, they've agreed to be a part of a, a tiny, and it's tiny because of the duration, not because of the participants and the numbers, um, action research project. And they're going to be looking together at uh, the HyFlex model and trying to determine whether or not using HyFlex results in measurable improvements in learner attendance and in student learning over that period of three months. And so what we're kind of thinking is that in order to make it viable, we would ask them to evaluate one class that has the high flex model and another that doesn't. And then for agencies that only have high flex, then it would just be their high flex students in, and uh, looking at the attendance uh, and determining whether or not students attend more if they have the option of doing high flex. If, for instance, Jennifer, they have transportation issues, are they choosing then to attend uh, via uh, online as opposed to in class? 
And then also, since each of these uh, uh, programs that are participating with us are, are uh, involved in uh, the EFLA program, or the, that we're asking them to take a look at the pre and post assessments of their learners. So everybody will have Hopefully everybody has a pretest on the students at this point, or if they have new students, they'll be pretesting them. And then at the end of, of uh, May, uh, taking a look at post-test, and we just are wanting to see, is there any significant difference between students who have attended online or attend, uh, attended in class? And are they show, you know, what are they showing in learning gains? It's just a very, it's a drop in the bucket of what we hope will, uh, you know, come and follow. Um, I think that all of the three uh, support projects, CASAS, OTAN, and CalPRO are very interested in HyFlex. And it's new in, in the sense that you folks are kind of like pioneers of a new project. And it, I think it hopefully will grow. So what we're looking at is, you know, determining on a very small scale, what kind of impact HyFlex has had with, with your uh, learners. And then, you know, as, as we move forward, it'll give information to the, to the leadership projects. Um, there, there's thought of perhaps being able to uh, you know, flesh it out more as we move forward. So we'll see. We'll see what kind of, of interest and response we get. I'm sorry, David, I saw a question there, but I didn't have a chance to read what your question was. was uh, David was asking, will the yes, action- Yes, and they're also going to be looking at attendance. And that's why Janice is showing how uh, in, in TOPS Enterprise, they can, can indicate that this is a high flex class. And then as, as we move forward, we'll have attendance data and assessment data. And we've developed a couple of, of uh, surveys that we're going to ask. One is a student survey. The other one is a, uh, an administrator survey. And hopefully we'll be able to put all of these together and come up with some sort of conclusions. And they've agreed that they will come back and share with us at CASA Summer Institute in June, um, what we've learned in this little bitty mini action research project. I look forward to that, Kay. I'm glad you're the one behind it, piloting all this effort and these, this research. I was in a- I think it's really a exciting. I mean, you know, I, I uh, miss my, uh, uh, on-site time from back when I was working more face-to-face -face with with uh, teachers and learners and I think it's really exciting that that you folks are willing to uh, take a look at this and and determine you know is this viable uh, and if it is you know hopefully it will expand and more people will take advantage of providing these options for their learners I think all teachers know that there's such a power in attendance that a student that attends regularly stays with their cohort. They tend to retain information better. And if there's something about HyFlex that allows them to keep their attendance in a more uniform fashion, not only does it um, help their retention, it helps the school when it comes time to do the post-testing because everybody is more caught up and proceeding as a group. I, uh, heard that from a colleague in Rhode Island at a conference recently, and she said that that's been a huge benefit of HyFlex, that they're, that they're all staying together and that there are no holes. Uh, anybody in the audience want to share a little bit about what your agency is doing with HyFlex? I'm going to look for um, hands up if you want to raise your hand, see if there's any other questions you have for our panelists. We're kind of right on time, thankfully. My agency's not doing anything at all with this. And it seems to be the way of the TDLS, which is always way ahead of my agency. Thanks, Would Karen. You? 
what, what agency are you with? West Contra Costa. We had requested some hybrid classes this year, but it didn't happen. So we have either or at this point, and I haven't heard any plans for next year, but I'll bring a little report about this. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, Martha, I see your hand. Did you want to share a, you know, a question I, or a comment? I do. I kind of have a little bit of everything. <laughs> Perfect. Bring it on. Uh, so my agency is Los Angeles Community College District, um, and I am, my home college is City College. Um, and so we have nine colleges in our district. So there's a lot of different things happening. Um, high flex is really a high priority on our district's um, sort of to-do list and agenda and, and list of goals. And it is being implemented in the district. Um, at my school, we are not, um, we're not doing high flex in our non-credit program right now, but not for any kind of specific reason. It's just sort of the way the enrollment um, came together. Um, we are using uh, high flex cameras though. I love my owl camera for my online classes, even for just using it like a webcam. It's so, so nice. Um, uh, because I can teach in my classroom and use my board and, and it's really fantastic. But we do have a couple other colleges in the district who have done almost exclusively high flex this semester and they're having a lot of success. Now they're doing this in their credit classes as well. So um, we're kind of getting um, a lot of sort of action research ideas from all kind of different contexts across the district. I am so, and I was kind of late to this because I was teaching just a few minutes ago. And so I just came in and the first thing I saw was that slide that said new high flex option in tops pro. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best. <laughs> so I'm super excited about this. And, uh, yeah, I think that we're probably, this is going to be a big um, action project for us at City specifically in the next couple semesters, um, you know, especially like our intercessions when we do the most kind of experimentation, but um, it's, it's definitely um, a high priority for students. It's students are the ones that are really like, hey, I like this remote option kind of mix thing happening. So uh, I think it's going to, we're going to see some good outcomes from this. That's all. <laughs> awesome, Martha. I want to talk to you more about this. Would you send me a note or uh, jfair at casas.org? I would love mm -hmm. to. Yeah, definitely. I'll put my I'll put my email in the chat. Great. Thank just, you. Okay. Dr. Todd Wold, you have the stage. What's up? What's your thoughts? Let me get this on. How how is everybody? Great. Thank you. Um, I I wanted to share with you just a couple of things. Um, I one I appreciate all of you guys sharing your stories and. Um, we had a chance to uh, implement a new NCCR course, uh, Intro to Construction, this year, uh, of which I'm teaching, um, you know, because we can't find anybody with CTE credentials, of course. Um, but uh, we've pretty much been able to do this model. Of course, there's some in-person stuff that we have to be able to do uh, with construction. So, you know, power tools, hand tools, and they have to do performance tasks and demonstrate safety and proficiency and things of the sort and you know wearing proper um, safety equipment um but with that um you know we're a small district but we're across 725 square miles and uh there are pockets of poor community uh, of, of poor uh, members of our community that are really um spaced out and for us to offer a program um where we have enough students to even offer the class in any one of these uh, kind of pocket locations just doesn't fly. Uh, so this model has made it uh, more accessible. So I, I wanted to point that out. Um, every single one of the um, students that um, signed up for the course is, um, is Latino. Um, most of them are uh, bilingual Latino, uh, if not all. Um, and and so the other thing I wanted to point out is having a uh, like our my program secretary, um, uh, and Millie Carreño is her name. Um, she, being bilingual and and, and very tech savvy, uh, has been able to do a lot of those things like Steve pointed out earlier and others pointed out earlier as well. Uh, just how do I get into an email and how do we get onto Zoom? And we created a. Um, 
Um, what? Sorry, I'm going to ask her right now. Hey, Millie, what's what's the name of our uh, ttusd.edu uh, domain? Thank you. Uh, we had to separate a, a different domain so that our adult ed students didn't have access to the K-12 students in the district. And so even some things like that where we had to set them up with their very first email ever. Um, but it, we've seen um, higher persistence. We've seen higher participation, higher access. And like I said, by 100%, um, people in our community who traditionally don't have as much access. So it's been it's pretty cool. I appreciate you guys telling your stories. Carla, do we have time for a quick one minute poll just as we end up our our discussion today? I see there's a couple. Yeah, minutes. let's let's launch that. Is that is this a good time? Sure. Thank you so much. Let's go. Poll number two. The question is, how was today's panel helpful to you? Select all that apply. Ideas for training instructors, methods for engaging students, hardware and software to research further additional ways to analyze barriers or outcomes, or maybe something else that you picked up on that was encouraging or challenging. We appreciate your feedback on this. Hey, Janice, is there any way that we as a group could see Elisa put her owl in action? Uh, we've got three minutes, or um, Elisa, were you gonna do your owl at 2.45? Um, I'm not going to do it at 2.45, but I do have a session, I think at one o'clock. I have another session today and I will do it, but I just set it up. If, if you have like a minute, I could, I could set it up real fast. Thank you to all our panelists. We appreciate so much your help, your time. Elisa, Steve, Laura, Stephen, Jennifer, thank you so much. Thank you for asking. So you have 72 responded. Uh, should I show share results? Yes, please. There we go. See them? Thank you. I did. And I don't always manage to save the results of polls, so I grab my phone and take a picture of it so I could look at it later. All right, Alisa, you've got the floor. I'll stop sharing. Um, if you want to do share, I don't know if it's possible. She's. I can see she's moving around. Yeah. Do you see my, do you see a, a, a Google Doc? I see Google Docs, board? yes. Yes. So now I've left my computer, I've left my laptop and I'm walking in, the, I'm in the middle of my room at the front of the board. And now I can stand in front of the whiteboard and I can instruct the students that are in the class, but yet I'm still engaging with students on Zoom. And so through the Zoom um, annotation, because of our, um, insert. So as I'm moving, so this is how 360 works. As I'm moving, it's not instantaneous. It's through movement and sound. And so the, the camera will follow me, but it's not like right away. So it does get a little bit challenging when you have a conversation going because it will split. I don't have anybody else in my classroom, but if another student was talking, it would split the screen and it would show that student plus myself because we are having a conversation. But sometimes by the time that student talks, the camera picks it up. I've had a conversation with someone else. So again, it's not really, you know, it's not a hundred percent, but it does work. So I can um, ask Steve, you know, I, I see Steve on my big whiteboard. The in-class students can see Steve on the whiteboard. And I can say, Steve, you know, do you have a question for one of my students in class? And then he can unmute and talk to the students. Uh, I don't have a question at this time. <laughs> so we're going to practice conversation, you know, blah, blah, blah. So as you can see um, on your end, you'll see that there's a big panoramic um, view of my classroom right now. And then on the bottom, that's where it will either do a single screen, a split screen, or even in three, depending on the motion and the conversations that are happening. Can you hear me pretty well? Yeah, pretty good. I was going to ask, do you, are you taking input from your, your headset mic or from the owl mic? No, I actually had to take my headset off. I was using the headset. Oh, I didn't, when I, I can't see that part, sorry. Yeah, so okay. I took my headset off. So the OWL has uh, uh, its own built-in speaker and um, microphone. So I can walk around the classroom pretty much anywhere. And I'm, I'm speaking a little bit above normal voice, um, just because yeah. I want to make sure, I, I might not even have to. And so I'm able to now go help students that I need to in the class while still being engaged with students online and vice versa. So that's kind of how the OWL works. 
Is there any um, way to is there any way to focus onto the boards or the TV or does it have that capability to zoom in on those? Yeah, there is. Um, there's a phone app that I can actually like freeze the screen so that it's only focusing on one. But because there's so much interactive, like if I'm sharing my curriculum or I'm sharing anything, I'm projecting share screen here. Um, it's hard for my students to. It's hard just normally to navigate between the thumbnail of uh, the presentation versus me talking. And so that's something that we had to teach our students about flipping back and forth between if I'm writing on this board, then they're going to want to look at this. But if I'm talking about something, then they're, they're going to want to focus on me. So mm -hmm. that's that, again, is another one of the struggles with, um, uh, you know, navigating the whole system with our students too. And then also not being, not looking at the camera on my computer anymore. That was a hard, I have to look at the owl because the camera is now here. And I can't stand too close because then it like, <laughs> it gets oh, too yeah. close to the show. <laughs> I am so sorry I have to stop. I know Carla has to go. She's got another presentation to manage. Alisa, you came through in a pinch. Thank you. We look forward to your 245 presentation. Everyone be sure to check out that. Thank you to all our presenters. We appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you all at Summer Institute.